everybody. Good evening, McLean County. Um, this is Julie Emig from the McLean County Museum of History, and I'm delighted to share the ninth installment of our series, Breaking Bread. Um, we explore the shared and different backgrounds and experiences that local migrant communities have had. Um, we love sharing their stories, family, tradition, trauma, exchange. Each episode also features the shared experience of food, hence breaking bread as our guiding metaphor. To watch previous programs in this series, find McLean County Museum of History on YouTube. Today's session is called America Meets East Asia, Mayonnaise in the Sushi. Um, before I start the program, I want to share the McLean County Museum of History's land acknowledgement statement, which is a formal recognition that respects indigenous peoples as traditional stewards of our land. As a museum of history, we think it very important to make this part of our regu regular practice. It's one of our rituals. We acknowledge the past. And may I remind you that yesterday was Indigenous Peoples Day. The land we call McLean County is the ancestral land of many native groups, beginning with the Paleo Indians 12,000 years ago, and most recently Algonquin speaking groups, including the Kickapoo, who were forced west from this area in the 1830s. And as always, I am delighted to thank our valuable partners, Be In Welcoming, which is a coalition of the Immigration Project, not in our town, not in our schools, the West Bloomington Revitalization Project, the Mennonite Church of Normal, and the First United Methodist Church, who worked together to create a supportive environment for immigrants across McLean County. We are also partnering with Design Street Studio at Illinois State University and Heartland Community College, our partners in education. Now back to this evening's program. Nabuko Adachi and Jim Stanlaw, professors of sociology and anthropology at Illinois State will explore the intersection of East Asian and American cuisines and cultures. Nabuko is an anthropologist specializing in linguistics, diaspora studies and ethno history. Jim focuses on linguistic anthropology, cognition, popular culture, Japan and Southeast Asia. And I understand that they are co-editors of Pan Japan, the International Journal of Japanese Diaspora. So we will conclude this webinar with your questions. Feel free to post questions and comments in the chat. It's fun to track your thinking. And I'm going to very um, quietly go dark while Jim and Nabuko carry us forward. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Julie, for that fine introduction, um, and Hannah, and everybody who in, uh, was involved in inviting us here. I'm, I'm Jim Stanlaw, and... Nobuko Adachi. Okay, we'd like, <laughs> nice to meet you. We, again, uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about, about sushi in the United States, and then uh, later toward the end of um, our tirade here, talking about um, Japanese food and Japanese cuisine uh, in McLean County, and maybe talk a little bit about some of the restaurants uh, that we can find some sushi today. And Nobuko has even promised to, to later on post a, a sushi recipe. So uh, that'll be interesting. <laughs> well, okay. Considering that I can't boil water, I think it's going to be a, a major improvement. So um, you have that to look forward to. But in, in any case, I, I, I guess I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes uh, about things and, and then I'm going to pass over some stuff back to Nobuko. Um, and so we're going to be playing touch football here a little bit. And of course, we both will be uh, feeling free to interrupt each other um, as we always do. So um, I, I recall for some of you who are of a certain age, you might remember uh, a guy named Howard Dean who was running for president um, for the Democratic Party, the nomination back in 2004. And at the Iowa caucus, okay, um, let me just quote here, a conservative political group called this campaign a latte drinking, sushi eating, Hollywood loving freak show. Um, and of course, we had to make sure sushi eating is it would be part of the, the freak show right there. But I guess our reaction to this now looking in, in, in retrospect is my how times have changed. OK, uh, I think no longer would people think sushi eating is something uh, you find in a freak show or something weird or odd. And in fact, um, if you go to Peoria, um, 
that pulse of the nation, the perennial pulse that tells us, you know, what's, what's new in America and what will float in America, you will find, I think, four um, sushi restaurants, if not more, uh, in Peoria. And it's not just even in Peoria, but even in our own backyard, you can find sushi in McLean County. And we'll be talking about that a little bit. So I would say there's lots of sushi here, uh, which Nobuko will tell you about in, in just a minute. Uh, we're going to come back to comparing uh, sushi and Nobuko sometime in just a minute, as soon as I uh, finish about what we're going to be doing here in a second. We'll come back to these slides in just a minute. Um, but um, I guess let me just kind of make a couple comments here real quickly. Um, in, in fact, I'm I always get ahead of myself here. So today we're gonna to talk about a bunch of things. First of all, we're gonna be talking about what sushi is and what it might not be. And I think we're gonna find that um, what we're gonna be saying about sushi may be a little bit different about some of your preconceptions that you might be having if you're a typical American, whatever that might be. Um, because as we'll see, Americans have a notion of what sushi is supposed to be. And indeed, America now, uh, we're finding, also has notions about how sushi can be made. And so a question that we'll be talking about, I think, this evening, and maybe sometime in the chat as well, is that who owns sushi? Who is right? Can Americans make sushi? Is American sushi as good or is the same or, or, as sushi in Japan? What's more authentic? Uh, so who, who, who can claim to possess sushi? Um, and I think we're going to show and going to argue that in this transnational, globalized, international world, the kind of stuff that Nobuko specializes in, um, that borrowing and contact and, um, yes, even a cultural appropriation, I think is common and, and inevitable. And um, in, in that sense, I think you could argue that sushi in, in many ways is just as much American as it is Japanese. Um, and these the American contributions, I think, have, have been seminal and cuisine changing as, as well, I think. So, I mean, and, and this is, again, nothing really new. I mean, think about uh, spaghetti and pizza. Think about chop suey. Think about anything Tex-Mex. Um, many things that have been taken in the United States oftentimes go back. Uh, not only to become Americanized here, but oftentimes they go back to the donor country initially. And so all this is a long convoluted way of saying that sushi has taken um, a very long road from Tokyo to Toledo uh, and back again. But along the way, it's made some interesting stops, in particular, as we'll see, in Chicago and, and now Bloomington. Um, and we're going to talk about some of these tonight. So let's kind of get on the sushi boat here. So I guess I'll turn it over to Nobuko here a little bit and let her talk now um, about sushi and maybe some sushi in her hometown uh, and just what exactly is sushi. So I'll pass it over to you, Nobuko. Could you go back to slide? I did. Thank you. Okay. So when I arrived in the, uh, like, uh, when I came to North America, I was in Toronto University because I went to University of Toronto. Over there, they have like a lot of Japanese people and then big restaurants. So I could eat normal sushi, like which you are watching, seeing the slice. But then when I get a job here, I thought like, oh my God, I can't have any more sushi. <laughs> I expected that. But then Jim said, like, there is sushi. Yeah, we can go. And he took me to the, uh, this kind of place, like, uh, this place is like restaurant, China, like, uh, sushi restaurants. Then when I saw sushi all like this, can you see this is a steak sushi? <laughs> and then this is like a kind of Hawaiian hat kind of wearing things and like, lots of tempura around here. And I thought, like, what? This is really what? <laughs> like a cocktail kind of thing. And not only that, this is like a hamburger sushi, they say. And this is like a burrito sushi. Yes, we do have a hand rolled one, but this really looks like a burritos. It's, I don't know what is different about it, but it's different. <laughs> when then I, I thought of how it's different. And I looked at the ingredients kind of thing. We don't usually use, like I put the uh, even hand rolled kind of sushi, like a salad kind of thing. But in here, we, you can, as you can see the, uh, like uh, here, like a salad and those kind of raw vegetables. And then I start putting the uh, um, carrots in sushi without cooking it. My sister said, when I was in Japan, I was talking about it, what kind of sushi I made it for my friends in America. She said, Nobuko, please don't tell them this is sushi. This is at least not a Japanese sushi. Maybe you can say California invasion, not ours. Please don't say that kind of thing. She was just trying, she was really, really upset about it. So what we, are, can you go down one? Sure. And what are we are seeing like a sushi? This is the restaurant sushi we have. <clears throat> and you can see these ones 
um, for the menu in, in our restaurants, like, you know, raw fish sushi type of things. And uh, that's the one we do have on, as a sushi. So from this one to like McLean County in Illinois sushi, which you are seeing it before, is very different. Could go back and forth, Jim. You know what is different, how they look different. Probably taste very different, you can guess. Right, go down, please. Now, these are restaurant sushi, but we can order sushi too in Japan. This is an order of like a flyers. You, know, you can have this, we call it nigiri, ed edo sushi. I will talk about what is edo sushi. It's a kind of nigiri, means like, you know, um, put the sushi rice here and then like they just squeeze it to make it. That's why we call nigiri sushi and uh, sushi. Um, but uh, however, I've kind of sushi too, because this nigiri sushi doesn't make you so full. That's why I think in the United States, you can just eat those ones at the bar. But then I like, uh, these ones, you can see these, we call bold sushi. Got a, those ones that rice behind, got underneath, and I put lots of, like the same kind of ingredients on it. This makes it a little bit of food. And it's this one too as a sushi. I don't know, I've never seen this much, this one much in our town, but these ones are also part of sushi as you can see. And going to the end. So what is really sushi I'm eating at home? People tell me, oh, by the way, what up? Yeah, this is also sushi. And these ones are just a side dish, noodles and those things, by the way, I forgot to. Um, Karaage chicken and those things, because as I said, only nigiri sushi, like this sushi, doesn't make you full. So it's not an everyday food, by the way, it's a kind of event food. Then I go, what, but also another event food um, we eat at home. Uh, this is my grandma's I got a village. Um, we had a, every summer we have a summer festivals. We have a bon odor, it means summer dance. Well, like in a summer kind of like, fest, like it's music festival to dance festival to everything packed into a one, two days. And um, my grandma called all us, all of our grandchildren and like the parents, our parents get together. So she prepared food like this sushi. This one, this one too. These ones do not have much of fish, but or like boiled shrimp, but a little bit of eggs and other type of vegetables in here. And she doesn't make this like a real, like a, you saw the uh, sushi got with fish. This one, we order it from a restaurant. So like we combine sushi and those ones as festival food, not a daily food. As it, um, that's what I, I grew up with. But a Jap American people always ask me, Japanese people eat sushi only, kind of, or tempura sushi, and only that. No, these ones are very special occasion food for us. Okay. And then so like a handmade, like, you know, because it's very difficult to get even in Japan, these like, fresh fish every day in our kitchen. So every day we have to go get them if you want to make it, but it's very difficult, this only rice, to make it to the right amount of pressure in your hand. And that's why we have to always ask professionals. On the other hand, this kind of bowl kind of fish, a bowl kind of su sushi, you can, Everybody can make it. And uh, that's what we ate. Okay, now I just want to talk about this sushi part. Go to the next one. This is not a, like a America's one, like a, this maki roll. It, it's like a salmon and tuna. Yes, we do have those ones, but those ones are very expensive. And uh, during World War II, like you know, they needed more like a you know, cheaper type of like, a, like a ingredients. And then they came up with this, I don't know how to pronounce it. I asked him, but kalabash, is a kalabash, is it okay? <clears throat> kalabash roll. I mean, this one we can just, this is a kalabash. Um, 
it's a very common uh, plant in Japan. And uh, we take those ones seed around it and uh, make dry it and make it to this next, this one. We call it kampyo. And then we boil it with, boil this one with soy sauce and sugar, a little bit of soy like salt, because salt makes it much sweeter. So put them together and boil it. And that is going to be this one. And that's why we, we, we say kampyo maki, kampyo roll. And um, so that kind of food we eat for some kind of event, um, festivals, and sometimes like you know, a uh, wedding, birthday, and then those type of things. But before we go into more, do you want to talk about next one, Jim? Well, I thought you might talk a little bit about the, the history of it, if you'd like. Did you want to talk about a Hayasushi or, or? Hayasushi, I don't, I mean, not much of, but Nigiri Zushi is the same kind of thing, but it was born late Edo period. Edo period means 1603 to 1868. You folks knows as a samurai period. And then like in that period, like a much late, late uh, Edo period, 1800 or so, because Edo has a lot of people moving in. Of course, during that time, they, they kind of freely moved around in Japan, all over in Japan, but still like some places had a um, problem for the uh, like a uh, earthquake, like a natural disasters <clears throat> or like a those kind of thing, people couldn't really stay in the um, agricultural area. So people moved into Edo, period, Edo area. Edo is a, one of the biggest city in Japan. And then they tried to find jobs. So people moved in there and Edo has, Edo means, I'm sorry, Tokyo. Edo's current name is Tokyo. Tokyo has a Tokyo Bay. So they have a lot of different fish coming in so they can get the fish there. And then they have a really fresh fish and they started having this nigiri, um, nigiri zushi. But then that time was huge, like this huge rice bowl type of the uh, right, got a, uh, size. And then put the uh, fish on it. And then they were just at uh, the, uh, do you have the uh, gym? Like a uh, maybe not. Um, it's like a standing up, like kind of standing up place to eat. A and sushi then, stall? Yeah, we yes, have... but it's okay. Um, those kind of we'll come places, to that, I think. Those, yeah, later maybe you can show it, those ones. Okay. But anyhow, we they just grab those one couple of them and eat and then go to work. And many people did that for lunch and those things. It's cheaper and then filling, rice is filling. And it's a huge one. Not like a current sushi. Current sushi, as I said, even you eat two or three, it's not gonna make you full. And even like a five, six of them, it's for Japanese people, it's nothing. And about around that time, two or three, even like a big man can get full because it's a really huge one. Um, so around that time, around 1800, this kind of sushi is becoming more popular and popular. That's why nigiri sushi, Zu and su is the same thing because of this pronunciation. We just make sushi or zushi. Nimiri zushi is become called Edo zushi because Edo, Tokyo Bay, uh, it started it. Uh, then current, which you think of sushi is a Tokyo sushi. That's what we call. Then we have another type of sushi, like uh, that's what I'm showing it to you, like a chirashi sushi. It's not really like a fish on it. There are other type of sushi as well. And um, next one, I don't know. I, I, I was just going to say, I just took this picture. Uh, Shinai, he was kind of like a uh, contemporary of Hokusai, a very famous woodblock printer that probably people know because they saw these wonderful pictures on calendars of, of Mount Fuji. Uh, and, and he was a contemporary. And here you see him making uh, a woodblock print of, of some sushi in, uh, as you see in this, this this print right here. Um, I, I guess the only comment I would make before I start talking about the trip over to across the, the bay here is that to me, I almost kind of saw sushi at this time as the Big Mac of its day. Um, mm -hmm. As Nobuko said, 
uh, the, the civil war, the centuries of civil war in Japan had ended. Uh, Japan was now in several centuries of, of, of peace. And we saw a rising consumer class and consumer culture. And uh, a lot of people in the cities, especially uh, construction workers and things, needed fast food. And sushi initially was the fast food of the day. We don't think of that today. Right now, we think of it as being hot cuisine, being very expensive. But it really was, you know, the, you know, the Whopper, the Big Mac um, uh, of its day, because it could be eaten standing up. You could eat it with your fingers. You could eat it on the go. You could eat it like in kabuki theaters. You could eat it, you know, very informally. Um, it didn't, until later on, start taking on some of its, its other sachet about being kind of a fancy food. So um, maybe should I talk about it coming yeah. to America for a bit now, you think? You no, know, just uh, then th when you talk about those eat, like, uh, first food, that's uh -huh. why makizushi came up because otherwise rice sticks with your hands, the other type of food. That's why they start like uh, not to try to stick your hand. Uh, sushi got a chef start thinking about it. That's why the anori is around it. Right there, as I, I, th I think you can see the, I think you can see the cursor, right? Um, okay. Whoops. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I guess. Um, is that a right slide? You yeah, can there talk about the kaiten. Uh, you took off the kaiten. Yeah. Right? yeah. Mm -hmm. um, did you want to talk about that now, or should? Yeah, I can talk about it uh, go historically if you want me to. Well, may, uh, maybe we can kind of come back to that. Um, I, I guess, I guess we'll do, let's see. Um, oh, yeah, sushi. Let's talk about this. This, term. this term, sushi, talking about sushi, uh, I said different type of sushi. There is a two way of writing sushi, even Japanese letters. This is called kanji. But anyhow, this letter, this like a sushi, this one also called sushi. When you go to sushi restaurants, you are you see these letters instead of this these letters. This letter, if you see it, that's a family restaurant. If you see it at the sushi place, family restaurant or a little cheapo kind of thing. This is a daily. I mean, like a, it's a great this word great occasion, happy occasion, event. This one. So what happened is that. Oh, I'm using my curse, but are you? Oh, I'm sorry. Let you no, I'll let you do people it. cannot see my curse. Cursor, it got a heart. Maybe you are controlling it. All the time I was using it, but maybe. Can you see not. a cursor? Can you see a cursor? Yeah. Could okay. you, the first one, just pointing it out right. then? I'm right. sorry. I, 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 long, long time I made a mistake. That's the first letter is a good occasions. Okay, like a happy occasions. Can you see, Jim? Mm -hmm. Can you do it? What should I just mold? Okay. And then like the next one is event. Next word, no, like the right hand side to go. Oh, That's an event. Okay. So sushi, the first one is a happy occasions. Okay. Or the one word sushi. That is left side of the party saying like fish. So this is the one you say like edo sushi, fish, like a sushi. And there are two words it has but again as i said the second one is at the uh, sushi restaurants like a really good great, great sushi restaurant you see only the uh, second letters upper one is just a happy occasion sushi so sushi is becoming two different type of food in here that was the japanese and then then, then but what about the uh, like a funeral and death anniversary event. Uh, we have some food too, but uh, as you can see, can you see point out, Jim, for sashimi? Uh, where is sashimi? The less, like uh, the down, I mean, like uh, the first picture down there, right here. Like, uh, there. Can you see the, uh, like, uh, can you see sashimi? You can't see it? No. No, sashimi is here, Jim. Not that one. Um up like a blue blue ball there. That's the oh, just, oh. yeah, one. And also above one. Above one is much easier to see it. For, right from second one. Can you see that? Sashimi. Sashimi is right. Yeah, that's the one. That's sashimi. That's a fish, raw fish, but it's not sushi. We do eat sashimi part. 
raw fish part, but rice is coming differently. Like you can see left upper part, you can have a mixed rice in there. Can you see? Yeah, that's the one that's, yeah. So like a small, like those, those ones are soft. So you can eat it, you can put it in the rice bowl. You can sit down there. Can you, Jim, can you go that rice bowl? Yeah, you can just put it in, in the rice bowl from this rice cooker. That small kind of nice, cute one. Then put it into the bowl and by yourself. So you can eat tempura, sushi, and then many things. Do you see, Jim, can you can you put it cursor here? No? Where would you like to put it? The, the rice bowl, like a rice to rice bowl. Can you see the rice? Like a mixed rice was made in the little nice rice uh, cooker type of thing. It's okay. It don't, it's not necessary, Jim, if you don't know that. That's fine. If It's okay, Jim. Mm -hmm. Just those Mr. kind of things. Anyhow, point here is this is not sushi, but a part of sushi we do eat for the death anniversary event. We do like a, our ceremony and uh, once we per someone died of course we cry but uh, our fair little uh party kind of thing to the death person we just don't cry we just eat drink be sake beer eat a lot like this and then we try to smile and laugh so the dead person can go to their trouble go on to their trouble they can leave our place to go into the heaven. So if we cry, if we try to hang on to them, they cannot go to their trouble. So like, you know, we always try to eat nice and happy, try to be happier than you are and try to smile. So this kind of food is always served. That's what I wanted to tell. But the sushi itself is a happy occasion. So we, those ones are served for the weddings, birthday, graduation ceremony, and those things. And then, um, as I said, one, one more down, you can go. What happened for the restaurant sushi, like we are talking about? Only one thing, not fish, is this one. Atsuyaki tamago. It's a thick egg omelet roll. This is a kind of like a difficult to make it unless you are very expert of it. You put it, this is the one professionally sushi, sushi chef start making it except fish, sushi, rice, and a nigiri kind of thing. This is the only one not, su I mean, fish, those even expensive sushi restaurant serves it. As you can see how to make it, you can put little skinny, like a little bit of skinny, like a thin eggs you make at first at the left side, you can see. And then it's rolling it in the middle one. And then third one, you put more eggs in there and then you're gonna repeat, repeat, repeat. And then making it thicker and nice floppy eggs, like you can see on the top. And those ones, uh, those got eggs. But now this is a very difficult, first of all, a little difficult to make it to great taste and this floppy one, even export, and also time consuming that. Nowadays, the, even these um, eggs are ordered into those nice sushi restaurants. Of course, a very, very expensive place, they're gonna make it, but at normal, like our places to go, those ones are, they are buying this one and then serving it at the sushi restaurant too. By the way, next slide to just make, when I'm making, showing the how to make those kind of thing, you can make sushi rice too easily, but point is just that you have to know, probably in America, it's not so much difficult to make it because this is Compared to Japan, it's very dry. Japan is a very humid country. So when I make rice, fresh rice, hot one, just came out from the rice cooker, you dump it into this wood bowl, and the wooden one sucks all the extra moist. And in there, you even you can use fan. Of course, 
previous period we didn't have a fan. We used sense, I mean, fan, I got the hand, handmade, like a manual fan, and then mixing it with this one. And then you cannot mix it with the, uh, like a stirring it. You have to, we call it cut. And then between that cut, cut, you're gonna put the vinegar and you try to cut, 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 this kind of way of movement of the hand. Okay, can you see me? And then mixing the vinegar and already made vinegar, by the way, mixed rice vinegar. <clears throat> means like a rice, like a sushi vinegar. You can buy sushi vinegar nowadays in the United States. Japanese people start selling those on because it's difficult to make rice sushi vinegar. But rice vinegar and soy sauce, no, no, rice vinegar and then sugar, little bit of sugar and then salt again, not a soy sauce at all because then it's become blackish, blackish uh, color. So we don't want to have that. Color is also important for Japanese food. So that those rice vinegar, you're gonna mix it. That's kind of old about it. I, oh yeah, and then just that uh, giving the child sushi for, I don't know about. Well, I guess we'll talk a little bit maybe about maybe the, the, uh, the origin of sushi a bit. Um, I, I think one thing maybe, uh, and I'll pass it back to Nobuko in just a second here, but one thing I wanted to add is that, um, is that a lot of people. That, that a lot of people think sushi means raw fish, and it, it really doesn't. Basically, the su of sushi is basically focusing on, on vinegar. Uh, it's, it's the vinegared rice, the, the preserved rice, that really kind of makes sushi. sushi. And, and we'll be talking about that toward the end of our discussion later on when we start getting into authenticity. Because uh, many times, or at least sometimes, sushi made in America does not really uh, pay attention so much to the vinegar uh, of the vinegared rice. And so is, is that something that we really have to do to kind of make sushi sushi? So um, yeah, so I guess maybe we'll, we'll pass it back to Nobuko a little bit about uh, about some of the origins of sushi. Here's a, the, uh, the the sushi sauce she was asking about before. Uh, there's your sushi sauce stand you were mentioning. Mm. But yeah, we start talking about sushi a, a little bit before, but I got a really, really early part of sushi is like about 1500 years ago. That time was not vinegared. It was salted rice and, and a salted fish and salted rice. It's just that fish was like a, like a marinated for a couple of days with salt and then I got a rice. So like a rice and then like a fermented rice, as you know, is sake. It's gonna be that kind of taste, but with the salt. And then it was a long time, like only the like rich people, like an emperor and then those like a court people could eat it. But then until the end of Edo, those court people had those origin of sushi. But as I said, at around 1800, Edo sushi came up and they start making better vinegar, milder vinegar. And then I can start making really nice like a fish from Greek, like a Tokyo Bay and I start making sushi and I start serving it to people. But then it's become the, uh, do you go to the, uh, then um, what happened was 1923, Tokyo Great Earthquake. Um, we, uh, around lunchtime, like a seven, eight magnitude of 7.5, I think, magnitude of Japan, like an earthquake came in. And then people start preparing lunch around that time. So everybody's using fire. It's caused great like fire, like California, right, current California, and then burn all, all over Tokyo and destroyed. And then people couldn't get a job around that time. So even sushi chef start moving out from Tokyo because it was at Edo, Tokyo sushi. But then those chefs start moving all over to the other places. And then those ones put it out. Then Edo sushi too start spreading it out. And then second phase was, of course, World War II. And after World War II, Tokyo was destroyed by B-29, as you know. And then again, that one too pushed those to uh, sushi chef too to all over Japan. So these two times, 
pushing those exports to all over in Japan. Then actually around that time, sushi, Edo sushi, this fish uh, sushi become much, much, much more popular all over in Japan. Before it was a local food of Tokyo. And um, around that, uh, could you go down there? Just I wanted to mention. Edo sushi was because you have to use fresh, fresh sushi, fresh fish. Um, people even say like, uh, this is a gender discrimination. But as you may know, uh, sushi chef is only male, you can see in Japan, because they said a woman's hand is too warm to touch uh, fish and a fish can, cannot stay in that kind of like a temperature and um, then destroy the taste of it, they say. Uh, that's not true, but that's how it's been told. And that much they are careful about it. They don't put this, like a, like a, this, this one was uh, emperor's kind of period of like those vin, uh, salt and then like a rice and those type of sushi, they could use this one of course, to foment it, the left one, I'm sorry, to the head. I'm just using Carson. Um, left side of the one has a uh, lid, but the right hand side one, which I'm showing it, it doesn't have a lid. Because if you put a lid, you're gonna just make it to the uh, fish older. So in Japan, usually this kind of good fish, you don't have a cover to just deliver it. You have to eat it there. Nowadays, we start delivering it. We put the yeah, wraps and those kind of thing. But those ones are not that really expensive sushi. I mean, like you saw it like a little bit better sushi too, because nowadays we can deliver it and get a good one. But this, like this one, the picture, right-hand side one is really good picture. I mean, like fish. Those ones, you have to eat at a restaurant. Although, can you see the other one? Both of them has eggs. Can you go back to this right hand, go back to the other one, 22. And the right hand, 22, I mean, like, you know, yeah, right hand side, as you can see, right hand side, one right hand side, you can see the yellow one with a stamp. Stamp means you burn it. And uh, that one is Atsuyaki Tamago. That's the only not fish one that this one has. But this is a, that means this is a great, like, uh, expensive place, it's sushi. These ones are not delivered. Next, next slide, please, Jim. These ones are a little cheaper one. As you can see, they can even the top, right-hand side top, is a cucumber sushi maki too. While the other ones, it's already cooked one, or like a vinegar, already vinegar, like a, a, like a fish in the, like a top kind of thing, like you can see um, right-hand side, and uh, those kind of things. Uh, I put the, uh, cursor, but I, I think it didn't show up. Oh yeah, next one, can you go into the uh, next, right. next slide 24? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, by the way, this one, I wanted to let you know, like, you know, this, like, you know, between there, like sushi and sushi, we have the, uh, we put the uh, little green stuff. Now the cheap one, this is a plastic one. Used to be the, uh, like, uh, bamboo leaves and type of thing. I will show you that, that one later, but why do we have this one? Or like an, another one left like a downside, like a down part of the picture has a little bit like a nice, like a cup with a made it by, by paper cup type of thing. We divide food not to mix each other's taste because that is our culture that what chef make it is the best taste you have to taste it. Unlike other uh, cuisines, some of the other ethnic cuisines, you better mix them type of thing. So they don't care if the other ones are like left, left side and right hand side, like a, a dish can be like a mixed kind of thing. So you, they save, serve it on the a big dish and then they put different kind of thing. In Japan, we hate those ones extremely that either we're gonna serve it in the very small dishes or you can just divide it in like this kind of like a lunch box type of things. You have to put this plastic not to touch each other's food. And that is another etiquette we have. And then, like a, but this, but now we uh, just uh, to talk about this bamboo trees. Some 
previous period, we didn't have a really nice dish type of things that we use bamboo leaves as a wrapping kind of thing to even like another type of rice bowl. We're going to talk about it later, not using a fish, but those ones to put it in the uh, bamboo leaves. Well, like a, to serve, we didn't have a dish, I mean, good dish type of thing. This is disposable type of things. So really like a nature is important because we like this na like a natural as possible type of thing. Also smell is great and then takes up the yeah, little extra moist to it too. So you can see when you go to Japanese restaurants, sometimes very expensive places, still now they um, get these real like a leaves and then use it. That is a historical issues. And even nowadays, people try to do those kind of things. Is that okay, Moa? Should I talk more about well, that? Uh, I think we're gonna come back. Let me finish up the history a bit, how sushi came to America, and then I'll turn it back to you. You can describe the different kinds of sushi that people might not know about. Um, so I think Nobuko left us off uh, probably at the end of the Second World War when we found sushi kind of having a resurgence because again, a, 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 a matter of convenience and, and opportunity. Um, but at this time, of course, back in the 40s and 50s and 60s, uh, sushi was unknown to the United States until the late 1960s. And again, we can kind of either thank or blame this um, on, on Hollywood. With the exception of a few like uh, sushi stalls uh, in like little Tokyos or, or Japan towns in some of the West Coast cities like in LA and San Francisco, for the most part, sushi as we know it now was unknown uh, until the folks in Hollywood discovered it. So the folks in Century City and 20th Century Fox Studio discovered sushi and of course Hollywood embraced it as they, as they tend to do. It's, it's neat, it's cool, it's exotic, it's strange. Um, and so uh, a lot of the, uh, I guess the, the entrepreneurs realized that they could make some sushi that would be uh, working for the Americans palate. And so um, actors and, and, and stuff would go to these sushi places. And they were eating um, uh, sushi that basically was designed for Americans. But then uh, as movie stars tend to be, they want to have what the guy next door is eating. I want to have what the Japanese guy is eating. And so we started seeing gradually these, uh, these celebrities and started taking on more and more authentic um, kinds of sushi. And from there, it kind of spread out to New York and Chicago. And I'm going to mention one in particular because I think it's, it's I think worthwhile to know about something that happens in our own backyard. Um, as we all know, Second City was a, a major comedy club, uh, and I guess still is. Uh, and uh, most of the people from Saturday Night Live, or at least many of them, kind of uh, were alumni uh, of this, this improv group. And the most famous of them probably was John Belushi, who was a sushi holic. He was, he was crazy about sushi. Uh, I guess uh, Dan Aykroyd said that, um, I guess the inspiration for the Samurai Chef, that Saturday Night Live sketch that we see uh, John Belushi still doing, uh, I think on, on reruns, um, that I guess uh, skit was inspired by uh, sushi masters that uh, John Belushi knew at, at some of the sushi stores that were near uh, the, the Second City. At the same time, too, and in, in, uh, while it was becoming popular in California, the U.S. government was making dietary regulations and recommendations talking about um, a high cholesterol meat food. Red meat food was bad for your health. Uh, we should eat more, more fish and things. And so this, in a sense, is kind of what the doctor ordered. And again, you know, in, in the 70s and, and probably even in the 80s, we started seeing kind of a resurgence of things Japanese. So we saw the novel Shogun taking off and, and the, uh, the TV drama uh, series Shogun was also kind of a big hit. But um, the point behind all this is, is that um, all this now has become, I, I think, second nature because as, as the, the sushi presence has been in America, it's now uh, also become Americanized and it's gone back. So we started seeing that um, the California roll was invented, of course, guess where in California. This idea of an avocado roll uh, in crab wrapped with seaweed was, was, it was common. Uh, in, in Honolulu, where, where spam is, a, a, I guess, a ubiquitous kind of, uh, I'm not sure what, you, what to call it. Can't really call it meat, food. Um, uh, I, I, I guess some kind of consumable, uh, you would find spam sushi, of course. Um, and, and, and by the 2000s, we would see like even in places where there's high uh, 
percentage of, of Japanese overseas. So for example, like in Brazil, where there's a million and a half Japanese Brazilians, you started seeing the sushi bars uh, becoming more uh, common than uh, in, in Carrias or uh, places where you can, you know, for, for churros or other kind of traditional Japanese barbecue or Brazilian barbecue stores and like in San Paulo. Um, and, but the, the main thing is we started seeing all these things be, become uh, adopting to kind of like a local taste. So for example, here's the, the Godzilla roll from a local food store. We'll have a bit more to say about that in a minute. Uh, the rainbow roll was an invention from a New York chef, okay, Ayoko Shibata, who thought that you could take salmon, squid, shrimp, and flying fish, combine them together in a colorful kind of thing. Um, and she brought this back to Tokyo with, with great success. And at the same time too, um, again, in, in the 70s, we find in, in Tokyo now the, the Nixon roll, named after, of course, the, uh, the, the ubiquitous president, consisting of grilled eel, cucumber and cream cheese. And of course, New York made any number of different kinds of sushis, one of them being um, the spicy tuna roll, where you, you would find sushi chefs in New York basically taking kind of leftovers, uh, old scraps of fish that was kind of past their prime, smothering them, masking them in mayonnaise and chili, uh, and making uh, new kinds of uh, sushi. So um, I, I'm just going to read one quick quote from a, a, a Japan of, uh, a specialist here, Donald Ritchie, um, an expert on Japanese film, but he, he made a quote that I think in, at least uh, in a sense kind of uh, influenced me in terms of thinking about sushi. Nobuko is not quite as impressed as I, as I was, but let me just read a quote from him saying that, uh, and I'll read it here so I don't get it wrong. Japan is an enigma. And it demands special verbal imagination to approach it. It is therefore often depicted not as what it is, but what it is like. These metaphorical observations, each in its own way, indicate something so truly Japanese, a unique culture of wrappings, which envelopes all conceivable aspects of Japanese life. Uh, so this notion of, of talking about Japan being something that's wrapped and in, 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 in rolled is, is something we find uh, mentioned by, by many observers, uh, both Western and Asian, about Japan. Donald Ritchie was just probably the first one to articulate it this way. Even anthropologists like Levi Strauss have made comments about this. Um, so the, this idea of, of wrapping in, in Japanese, this idea of ho or tsutsumu or, or tsutsu, um, is, is something that we find, I think, I think popping up in, in many aspects of, of Japanese culture. And, and for me at least, uh, to kind of get a handle on thinking about sushi, uh, this idea of, of rolls of sushi, especially you know, the, the maki rolls, which Nobuko will be talking about in a minute, was I think a, a fruitful way to, to think about things, especially if you're interested in things like semiotics, the science of science, uh, this idea of wrapping. Uh, it, it appears in, in many aspects of Japanese culture. Um, so I think maybe at this point, I'm going to turn it back to, to, to Nobuko, who's going to get us a bit more concrete um, and, and talk a little bit about maybe the, the four kinds of sushis that there might be out there. Uh, so I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Nobuko. So maybe we'll, we can start with Inari Zushi and then kind of go from there. Again, Inari Zushi, to me, I think is the sort of notion of, of, of rice wrapped in, in this kind of fried tofu is, is very much... I think part of this idea of wrapping, but Nobuko disagrees. So no, no, um, it's wrapping for you, but for us, it's stuffing. Stuffing, stuffing okay. sushi to okay. me, and that's what we say. That's why it's different from maki. Maki is a roll, some, some, some maki roll, right? I have but a slide. We have a slide on that in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. This is an inari sushi. Inari means like a, some shrine which uh, worship fox. Fox is called like, that's why like uh, um, this outside, like a deep fried tofu, we call it fox <laughs> sometimes. So like a fox and inari is uh, always like a exchangeable word for the uh, Shinto nisms. That's why this inari sushi means like a deep fried tofu sushi. Okay, but it's inside is like a, just a plain like a vinaigrette rice or some people even put something in the rice and it's stuffed. That's, we can buy this deep fly tofu can in, like, already made, the taste is made with that sugar and the soy sauce. Um, if you go to the uh, Oriental food store, you can buy it. Like a, uh, you can just open up the can. You see a lot of these things comes up like a deep fry tofu. You just open up in the middle and then put the uh, rice in there. So that's very easy for us to make it. Number two, can you go into the uh, number two? 
and it gets second. Chirashi Zushi, that's what I was talking about earlier. This is like a spread out like a sushi. It's not rolling, but it's not like a, uh, it's not like a squeezing, it got a kind of squeeze to make it like a bowl kind of thing. It's not, it's spread out. It's a bowl of rice. And then you can see this like a uh, carrot. You can use the cookie cutters and then make flowers kind of thing, or whatever the shape you can do it. But then like a, just a little bit of a, got a hot water and then with a little bit of salt, you just boil it. So it's soft. It's not like a, I use, I tend to make it without cooking it. That's what my sister is saying. That's bad. <laughs> that is not a Japanese one. Japanese one is always boiled. So it's softer. So it's easy for the old folks like us to eat it without cracking our teeth. <laughs> and uh, then like, a, this is a, like a, like a, right? I mean, eggs, which you saw it, like a, I show it to you, like you can make it to thin one instead of making it thicker. And then like a, a diced it. And that's why you, that one, you can put, put it on here. And other things like you know, and these beans and those things. You can make this one as a vegetarian, uh, like a sushi. Sushi means without fish, it's a vegetarian to begin with. And uh, another type of things is nigiri sushi. This is the nigiri. We squeeze it, the rice. It's not really hot. Then you can. When we just squeeze it means when you put it in your mouth, this breaks down easily. That type of like a, air have to be in the between. Then make it better taste, people say. And that's why it's very hard for people to make it at home. Um, that, that one usually we order it from restaurant, okay? And next one is a maki sushi. That's what we are talking about. This is, we gotta put the uh, nori underneath and uh, nori and then on the uh, roller, and then nori, and then put rice, and then roll it. And this is a futomaki means thick one, big one. And next one you show it, because this is a hosomaki means smaller one. Okay, and uh, next one, okay. Then like a futomaki means like uh, the first one, like, like as I said, like a bigger one. Um, it's, you make hosomaki, and then you roll it again type of thing. So it's become much thicker, much bigger, like those ones are like, this is also like a skinnier roll and then make it to one more things and then make, could you go, could, why? Yeah, here, uh, no, no, don't go back to, just stay with this one. Right hand side, you can see the uh, really like eggs one. Inside like a one, two, three, four, five, five skinny roll one, small roll one. And then put it, we got more rice and then put it eggs. Or well, like the other one too, like the left side one. This one, you make it a smaller, smaller one and then make it flower shape and then start rolling it a bigger one. And then the other one, like nowadays we have a competitions, like a people's face and the flowers and those kind of thing. And then you, even you put the little bit of coloring kind of thing. Again, here, Japanese food, they don't use coloring thing. It's illegal in Japan to use it much. Um, these ones are made for the like a vinegar and I got, I got also leaves and then make it to different colors. So these colors are natural colors usually. And go to maybe next one. This is sashimi. That's what we are want, I wanted to let you know that in the uh, funeral and also like a funeral anniversaries, uh, we eat only sashimi, not the rice part. So some people, vegetarian people, maybe not able to eat it, but for us, if we have a too much rice, we get full, but we would like to eat raw fish more. So I like to go to sashimi more actually, <laughs> that type of things. And the next one, uh, these ones are makizus, I mean, a component. I don't know, this is American version. This looks weird to me, Jim. This is your, your picture, I think. Yeah, uh, I, I think for right now, um, what I'm gonna do is talk for just a minute um, about uh, maybe fusion sushi or, or alien sushi. Um, now, as I think we all know, these days, Americans are quite um, willing to borrow many things from Japan. Uh, people are reading manga, they're watching anime, they like Japanese video games, uh, they like comic books and Japanese films, uh, they're wearing Hello Kitty backpacks, they're, and, and all kinds of other devices and so on. Um, 
And so and many have lamented the, the globalization of American style things and fast foods like McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, and, and pizza and stuff, which you can find anywhere. But we sometimes forget that Americans also import things and import foods from things abroad and, and especially food. And one of the things I find really interesting about this is that uh, of all the cultural objects that, um, uh, that are most restricted by taboos and prescriptions, um, most of which time we're very much unaware of, um, it is food. I mean, when you think about it, what we eat, what's the food, how we eat, when, when we eat, who we eat with, these are all extremely regulated by cultural, I think, prescriptions, though we never really think about them, we just kind of eat. So in one sense, it's kind of interesting that we find that food has been some of the most ubiquitous things that people have, have borrowed and, and have taken abroad. So there's, there's almost like a, a syntax of food here a little bit. And if this is a, a, a talk in linguistics, we can kind of go through and, and talk about the different kinds of languages that food possesses. So for example, um, particular settings, devices to use to eat, um, the sense of aesthetics, which must go along with things. Um, and, and generally these sense of aesthetics though aren't really borrowed when they're taken in and, and overseas. Um, and but what happens though, they, they become nativized and, and, and they become changed in, in many ways. And so what I'm going to talk about really quickly here is that we, we looked at sushis in a, in a whole bunch of restaurants across the Midwest. And, and I'm going to be showing you things now that none of which you'd find in Japan. Uh, these are just some examples I'd be talking about it in, in more detail if we have some time, but I'm going to skip some mercifully. But you see things like sunshine rolls or snake bite rolls here, which are made of deep fried yellowtail with no rice, topped with green onions, sesame seeds, um, eel sauce, and mayonnaise. Japanese see this and they are, well, initially, they were appalled. They said, what the heck is this? In fact, Nobuko still sees this. I mean, there are sushi, quote unquote sushi, in America that Nobuko will not eat. You know, banana uh, sushi. I don't want to have a monkey, crazy monkey roll. A crazy I monkey roll. A crazy monkey roll is great sushi. I really, really love it. I can't eat all of it, but uh, Nobuko says she will not even touch it. So um, all kinds of, 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 of sushi that have been invented in America. Spicy gringo roll, the thriller roll based from Michael Jackson. Uh, the Godzilla bomb, the shaggy dog roll. You see, see the shape here. Uh, things named on places like in Philadelphia um or, or all kinds of things and so um one of the things we found is that there are hundreds of different kinds of american sushis that are out there some made from from university things some made from um superhero characters like the king kong roll uh, the godzilla roll the ninja roll um and then there's a whole bunch of made from i think emotions or what i think are sexually innuendos um we haven't eaten these pictures yet but we'll get to them the i'm a flirt roll with spicy tuna and crab sticks, the sex in the city roll, the sweet 16 roll, the tender 11 roll, the sweetheart roll. So there's, there's a whole bunch out there. Um, we're going to come back to Mexican foods in a minute, but what I want to do is skip ahead to a whole bunch of things and talk about um, McLean County for a second. And then we're going to come back and talk about this admixture and, and median cultures again. So um, as probably many of you know, in, and we're, we're basically being anthropologists here and using pseudonyms in all the things we're talking about. Um, a restaurant that we'll call The Grand Kitchen uh, started in 1921 here in Bloomington Normal, one of the first uh, Asian restaurants in the Midwest, uh, even before Chicago. Uh, I mean, there's some debate about whether or not it was the first or not. The building lasted until 2017, 2015. Um, this restaurant under other management, of course, is still existing under a, a, a different uh, auspices, but uh, they were the ones that first brought Asian food to McLean County, to, to Bloomington Normal. Uh, and, and Chinese food, there were other Chinese foods restaurants came for a while and we ubiquitous for quite some time. And, and while I'm at it, I want to make a shout out to the McLean County Museum of History. Uh, they have a marvelous resource for anybody interested in food. Um, they have a collection of menus that go back to 1936 uh, from all different kinds of places. I, I, I don't know when it actually stopped, um, but I, I, I think it's 2016, but there may be more. But this is a marvelous resource for anybody who wanted to do some work about um, food in McLean County, because uh, it's, it's really lots of fun. So uh, there were Chinese restaurants then uh, from the from at least the 20s uh, until the 1980s. And then a big change came to normal. Um, and of course, many of us who are of a certain age know this. Uh, at first came Daimusar Motors Corporation, a joint venture between Chrysler and Mitsubishi. And part of the problem was is that uh, at this time, Japanese cars were becoming quite um, 
quite competitive. And there were made, there were uh, stipulations made about import limitations about how many cars could be imported from Japan to the United States. Uh, Mitsubishi was was a bestseller uh, from the Chrysler Corporation, um, and so it, in order to sell more, they they wanted to come up with a joint venture, Mitsubishi. So um, and and Chrysler joined forces and made Diamond Star. Eventually, uh, because Mitsubishi was doing so well, they bought out Chrysler uh, and became Mitsubishi Motor. Uh, Motors of North America, and they are now today's Rivian plant, of course. And uh, for about 20 years, they successfully made uh, lots of cars, as you can see from an old picture here. And um, a lot of pre there were a lot of problems over that happened. Partly was there was a scandal in Japan itself, but the Mitsubishi Corporation. Another problem was the so-called zero zero zero, um, I guess, promotion from the, the Mitsubishi uh, company here in America. That is. Zero interest, zero percent down, and uh, twelve months free. In fact, both Nobuko and I took up Mitsubishi on the steel. We bought cars, uh, but unlike a lot of uh, people, um, we paid ours back, but others didn't. And so Mitsubishi lost a lot, a lot of money from the zero, zero, zero. Um, I, I guess promotion. So that um, and also other things kind of going on, basically to make a long story short, uh, found Mitsubishi in dire straits and they decided to eliminate production in, in normal in North America. Now, when Mitsubishi started in the late 1980s, okay, a restaurant called Tachibana uh, at Seven Currency Drive uh, was built. Now, this was a, a high end restaurant basically for Mitsubishi executives uh, to entertain. It later morphed and became Hayashi. It is now still there today as the Harmony uh, Korean barbecue. But uh, the more important and more interesting thing was uh, for us is Akamia. Now, Akamia is probably a store that many of you don't know about. It's, it's ceased past um, it, it's, uh, its prime. It's going out of business now. Uh, this was not a, uh, in fact, I didn't take a picture of it when it was still extant. It was a store that did not advertise it was not intended for the Mitsubishi executives and the higher ups. This is where their workers were. And at one time, there were 526 um, em Japanese employees and, and specialists working at, uh, at Mitsubishi, people programming robots, some of them staying for six months at a time, some staying as long as three or four years. But in any case, these folks uh, hung out at Akemia, which was a, a, um, which a, a, a local restaurant. Now the building still survives um, at, at the Fort Jesse Cafe and Twin Cities Trophy. That's the building where uh, we would find the old Akemia restaurant. But at, at this place is where you found the real heart, I think, of, of local Japanese culture and, and Japanese cuisine. Um, now, you might ask, what, what's going on today? Well, um, as we said, sushi has become popular, not just in McLean County, but worldwide. And so there are at least five places in, uh, in Normal where you can find sushi. Um, and here you get an idea of some of the, uh, the different kind of rolls that different, uh, I, I guess, manufacturers here in McLean County are making. Uh, you can probably go off and, and chess it out yourself. Again, notice we have some that are common like for example, Rainbow Roll, Godzilla Roll, but every store has their own, their own kind here uh, and their own specialty, the Fujiyama Roll, uh, a mispronunciation saying Fujisan, by the way, SR7 right there. Um, and uh, high-end restaurants are also serving sushi, among other things. Um, and then we have, like Nobuko was talking about before, the, the, the sushi bowls. Well, there's a, a Hawaiian restaurant that, that's serving uh, basically these, this kind of sushi uh, and Hawaiian bowls. We find that the sashimi is placed on top of these bowls with various kinds of, of toppings and so on. Uh, and then what we want to talk about here, and I'll pass it on to Nobuko, um, there's one, I think, restaurant that's doing something that's quite, I think, very common and quite ubiquitous all across North America. And that is the interesting combination of Mexican and sushi foods. So we, we have one here in town, we'll call it La Taqueria, okay, which also has a sushi bar. Uh, here's a picture from the Vedette back in 2014. So they've been around for quite some time, very successfully. Uh, they, they, they make some interesting food I like. Novico is gonna talk about this in just a second here. And they have their own kind of specialties. And the question would be, is it sushi or is it Mexican food? Is it American food? Is it something else? So I'm gonna ask Nobuko here to maybe to kind of finish them up uh, and, and, and comment upon this and then we'll maybe open it up for some questions here. So um, what, I, I argue that it is sushi. Nobuko says sometimes it's not. So I guess I'll turn it over to her to give her the last word. 
So what do you think? Could you put 128, number 128? 128. Only you need one. The, the last one, last, last slides, please. No, 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 not last. I'm sorry, the not last. Next slide, then. This is the one. This one? Okay. Now, we have onigiri and nigiri. Onigiri is we call rice ball, which doesn't have any vinaigrette taste, no vinegars, only rice. Or like mixing with it, the right hand side, you can see the different colors on those kind of thing. We mix with other things. And then that's still no vinegars. That's then like a we. Roll it, we squeeze it by different shapes. Kansai area has a, a kind of like a rounder one. And then in Kanto area where I'm from is like a, a triangle one. Of course, shape is different, but the point is that's what we call onigiri. Sometimes Jim said I can try to put a polite O for nigiri, edo, edo zushi kind of thing. So onigiri, I thought, like, what? So you want to eat rice bowl instead of sushi today? What he meant was he was trying to be polite form of edo sushi, fish like a fish sushi. But what happened is that is a rice bowl without vinegar. That one is without vinegar. That's not sushi to us at all. Therefore, what we would uh, the going back to the other, even this one. Look at the gonna really like uh, the snowball kind of like a bottom one, this little cute one. Those one has a fish and a shrimps, and those ones, we still not call it like a sushi. This is a rice bowl if you don't have the vinegar. What happened to this one, the Mexican restaurants, most of the Mexican restaurants, most of the sushi places, of course, chef is Mexicans nowadays because Japanese people do not immigrate to make sushi like uh, small cities. <laughs> Maybe big place <coughs> Chicago, but even then, there's a very few sushi shop, sushi one, sushi chef are uh, from Japan. Not like a restaurant. Japanese restaurants are here. Like owner, no Japanese owner is not gonna be in here. Uh, that many places are Chinese or Korean owners using somehow Mexican person as a chef. Now. That's fine. That can make sushi too, as we are saying, globalization, as long as vinegar is there. But our towns, one of the Mexican restaurants do not have vinegar. And then Jim loves that sushi. I said, that's not sushi. That's onigiri. That's a rice bowl. That's the only thing I was laughing about or what he, when he call it nigiri uh, onigiri and from that restaurant yes that's onigiri from that mexican restaurant because it has no vinegar in there i mean if you don't know the japanese word um maybe this onalific o is very difficult nigiri and onigiri but it's a completely different food one is just a rice bowl without vinegar that's not a sushi one nigiri without o is sushi that kind of thing we have now that said i'm talk i'm gonna just would like to mention at the end we don't we should keep a little bit more time for your question and comments but somehow as i said after world war ii japanese business is doing well and japanese people not necessarily wants to immigrate to the united states previous before world war ii yes Lots of like labor people came in. Those people are second generation, third generation, fourth generation nowadays. Those people stayed here. They are not sushi like a chef. Sushi chefs are supposed to come after World War II. The reason I talked about is, as I said, like two phases. We had 1923 and after like a World War II, sushi chef was spread out all over in Japan. And then Edo sushi become, the fish sushi became very popular in Japan too. Of course, we had a local food as a local food from Edo period, 1800 or so. But again, here, sushi is becoming popular after World War II all over in Japan as a fish, Edo sushi, Edo sushi, fish sushi. And those people do not immigrate here, nor people opening up restaurants like Chinese places, Chinese restaurants. So those people are making sushi 
with maybe a little cheaper to hire Mexican people, I mean, uh, chef. Lots of places, as you can see, Mexican people working. And uh, those people put it, instead of wasabi, horseradish, you know, like a green horseradish, lots of spicy, really spicy. We put those on in soy sauce and then eat sushi because that's killing the bacteria. That's how we, do, we did uh, previous period in Edo, for Edo sushi. But Mexican people put Tabasco and then spicy fish is making with it from Tabasco. So it's a great invention that uh, Mexican invent, invented new type of sushi with a, like a, uh, also like a coriander in there. It's a really nice taste, nice smell. And then many, like a, many other things they combine with Mexican food. Now the American sushi seems to me like a Mexican chef is recreating Japanese sushi. And, and that's very successfully. And that's all I wanted to mention it about American fusion sushi. And one more thing that American fusion sushi, you can tell from wherever the restaurant, depends on the restaurant, they change the names. So we don't know, we don't, Godzilla roll doesn't mean all over America has a Godzilla roll, exact the same thing. It's not like that. So they are making a, some kind of like a shape, some kind of taste, some kind of things. Each restaurant has a different kind of name. As you can see, like a rainbow, the rainbow uh, sushi or Godzilla sushi or Shreeder sushi, whatever it is, you can tell from the kind of sense. But in Japanese case, we would like to know what ingredients in there. So all Japanese sushi, you can tell the differences. Japanese traditional one, tuna sushi, uh, tuna, and uh, salmon sushi, or crab sushi, and those kind of way. Um, even like a maki roll, they are talking about salmon roll type of thing you can hear this ingredients name. So that's a very different Japanese traditional sushi and then fusion sushi from the name you can tell. Now, that, that one, that, that's I like to conclude what uh, the fusion kind of thing. I see the uh, two question here. Where is a good place to, from the uh, Chris Williams, thank you for coming here today. And I, uh, what, can I read it? Where is a good where is a good place to get non fishy sushi in Bloomington, Nova? I would say here Stanlo's a place. The reason behind it is, as I said, these ones are home sushi. They kind of, those ones are not restaurant sushi even in Japan. This is mm -hmm. like a chirashi sushi type of things. I don't know if we can buy it or not. Maybe in Chicago you can do it, but I've never seen it. Do you, Jim? Or other people, have you ever seen those ones? I'm trying to get know. chat here. I can't get chat. Well, okay. that was in a Q&A. Okay. Um, okay. okay. The, where is a good place to get non-fishy sushi in Bloomington Normal was Chris's question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, I, I, I can, there, there are, there are, there are, there are at least five places you can mention, you know. Um, well, no, that's no fishy one. There is no fish, like a, just a vegetable, right? Well, like, a, I don't know. Those restaurant has just a, fit, like a vegetable sushi. That's what I'm saying. That's only a, like a home food type of things, usually. This has been fascinating. Um, well, so I know that there's a vegetarian sushi option at Anjou above. That's right. Okay, then right. those places. Um, and but what I what struck me about the presentation, not only the origin of sushi in terms of of um, preserving the fish, right, and and that the rice was sort of the afterthought, right? It was the vehicle <laughs> used to preserve the fish um, and to kill the bacteria, and um, but the vinegar that's so critical. And, and, you know, when you were talking about the, it's a, it's a rice bowl, it's not sushi. There's no vinegar. There's no, you know, it's really interesting, you know, how, how this, this cuisine has just um, diversified over time, um, man. So, you know, it was in uh, the chat. There was a lot in the chat about, I had no idea about the origin of sushi. Oh my gosh, I've never thought I could eat fish, the ick factor, <laughs> you know, but I love sushi. Um, 
and and find that you can you can eat a lot of varieties of of sushi without consuming fish that's absolutely the case um and as number was saying i mean i think right now i think other uh i i guess uh ethnic cooks are adopting sushi as kind of a medium. So we're seeing, as, as Nobuko talked about and described, uh, some great creativity from Mexican chefs coming up with some new kinds of sushi. We're seeing the same thing with Korean, uh, you know, people who specialize in Korean cuisine, modifying it and making it their own. So I, I think what you see happening in, in, in McLean County is in a sense is what's happening, I think nationwide. We're, we're seeing uh, once more that this, this Sushi is being used as a medium, as, as, as kind of like a canvas right. uh, for these artists to express themselves in their own particular kinds of, I guess, uh, palettes and delicacies and, 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 and flavors. Um, so I, I, so it's, it's really marvelous. And, and some of these are indeed going back to Japan, um, though Japanese are, are maybe uh, at a, are loath to call them sushi. They call them other things. Okay, they may think, you know, that a California roll of sushi. Uh, and as you see, Nobuko even kind of cringy when I say that. But a California roll of sushi, Nobuko just kind of goes, not quite. But but it's still good. I mean, it doesn't <laughs> no, mean they eat it. I think anything was cream cheese. No, I'm saying monkey, crazy monkey, banana sushi. I yeah. said banana sushi. A crazy oh, monkey I... roll is a great sushi. You should try it sometime. She, she hasn't even tried it. She wouldn't even try it. Oh, I love it. Um, so there, there is a, a question from our, our friend Mike Matika. How does okay. sushi, how does sushi and images of sushi reflect American mm -hmm. stereotypes of Japan and Japanese people? Wow, Mike, how long how long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a question that can kind of go on forever. Or we can debate over a bottle of beer. Um, well, certainly, I think as we mentioned uh, at the beginning of our presentation, probably when people think. Japanese cuisine or Japanese food, what's the first thing that pops in your mind? It is sushi with or without vinegar. Okay, um, <laughs> that, that seems to be the stereotype people have of, of uh, I, I guess, of Japanese you know, cuisine, just like people probably think of you know, um, picking duck uh, or chop suey when you think Chinese food or-, or Pizza you know. for Italian food. P yeah. Italian people don't eat Pizza, oh, that, I mean, like, right. which I know that people. That's right. <laughs> that also, that's right. That ex, is ex, eccentric food for Northern Italian. Same right. thing. Sushi is, as I said earlier, inventing things. Mm -hmm. Even this vegetarian sushi, too. Like, uh, we don't eat it every day, but people call me, like, people tell me, like, are you eating sushi every day? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think most Americans do believe that this is common fare in Japan, that everybody's eating raw fish every day. Not even necessarily sushi, but sashimi, raw fish. I think mm -hmm. Japanese people are supposed to eat raw fish all the time, which of course is, is not true because the, the mainstay of, of, of Japanese cuisine and Japanese diet is, are, as you said, is vegetables, mm -hmm. you know, so. Also, men, when they drink sake, mm -hmm. they eat sushi. Mm -hmm. and not no, no, sushi, right. they eat sashimi. That raw fish. Ah, sashimi they, with the. Because the sake is rice, fermented rice that they have a high calorie. So, mm -hmm. like my brother in law, she, he is, he's a drinker, so he doesn't eat rice. <laughs> and then he eats like a sashimi or those other kind of oh, Japanese, yeah. like a dish, and then just drink. So, like uh, that kind of thing that like a sashimi, I mean, sushi is not, I mean, like a rice is extra, so he doesn't do it. I, I just noticed something in one of the, the, the chats. I just got the chats to work. Here's someone saying, actually a former student of ours. Uh, he says that he uh, he came from the It's Icky tribe, okay, but to opening his eyes and his palate. So if he can do it, I think you could be able to do it and try, you know, crazy monkey rolls. I know you think it's <laughs> icky, but you should try it. So here, here's a gentleman, okay, who, you know, who, who's been trained from little on that Americans shouldn't eat anything raw. If he can try eating raw fish, I think you can try eating a crazy monkey. Banana in rice? Banana and <laughs> rice is great. It's really, really good. You should try it sometime. Uh, I don't want to waste my money. I like to eat fish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see some other questions. Real Jim, yeah, you got. <laughs> um, yeah, and Carrie noted that it was it was fun to hear you talk about Akemiya. Oh yeah, Akemiya. That it was you, her Carrie. favorite right. restaurant. Had many mm -hmm. a celebration there. Um, 
Acamia is, is, is a marvelous institution, and I think someone at the museum should really document this uh, in, in much more detail, but it really was a center uh, of, of Japanese, especially Mitsubishi Japanese cultural life uh, for a decade and a half. Um, and it was a, an interesting place. They never advertised. Uh, it was more by word of mouth. I mean, people knew about it. Knew somebody, knew somebody, um, or or you're Japanese, and somehow it was it was part of the part of the air out there. Um, but it was really really interesting, and you would you know the the, the people were there would, would you know uh, it, it was always really fascinating. You hear a lot of Mitsubishi gossip. Mm -hmm. um, a very different atmosphere than when you went to Tachibana, uh, which is where you know the executives would go, and and or, or Americans who wanted to eat hot cuisine would go. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was a very very different feel. Um, it was it was very informal, um, very small, very local. Uh, you, you you could sit down with, with a Kami and she would talk to you about different stuff and whatever. Um, it, it it was a it was a fascinating place. Again, I agree with Terry. One of my favorite places, uh, and one that I, I miss a lot. Uh, we've never quite anything had anything quite come up to that or you know or equal to that since. Um, and I think it it, it was a, a special place and a special time. Probably we won't see something like that so again, at least maybe in Bloom to Normal, um, but I don't know. But uh, anyway, yeah. so yes, ca yes, Carrie, I agree. It was, it was a great place. You know? <laughs> I'm sorry, Novako, you were saying something? No, Kari, Kari, you have a great question. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how one eats sushi all in one bite, use of chopsticks, oh. how to dip in the soy sauce, and when you use the uh, pickled ginger? Um, that is like, you know, that is very important actually when you go to real sushi shop, how to use soy sauce. And um, can you show the uh, nigiri sushi? Is that okay for the slide? Uh, nigiri sushi, okay. Um, can you still see me? Can you still see the slides? You no. Do? No, okay. I didn't think so. So. All right. Uh, ba, 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 ba. But it's okay then. Uh, just that uh, you have a nigiri and then fish is over it, right? Mm -hmm. When you have a soy sauce there, you can take only fish part with the chopsticks, actually. Chopsticks. And then like a dip it in the soy sauce, just the one side a little bit, and then put it back on the rice, and then mm -hmm. you eat it. But then usually when you go to great like a sushi shop, we don't use uh, chopsticks to eat sushi. After you do that, you're gonna just use your hand and eat, eat it. Ah, okay. The, because Edo Zushi is from the beginning, like uh, Jim was talking about fast food, like a uh, hand kind of eat, eating thing. Right. Like, right. Like, uh, that kind of habit is there, but right. just the how to, we use those kind of really expensive places, usually even not to put a soy sauce, but still you're allowed to use soy sauce. That's why we use chopsticks. That was kind of like a, different kind of mana it came from historically so use it to put it back but you eat with a chop, like a hands that type of things and an interesting thing is when you go to really expensive restaurants they have a completely different sets of words how to order soy sauce we say soy sauce soy so, soy sauce too in japan but if you go to sushi shop we call purple murasaki purple because soy sauce color is probably the a dark purple kind of thing for Japanese people. Yeah, like even many things are different. Like a tea too, we ocha, but we don't say tea. Agari means like a different type of vocabularies. So they are showing their knowledge of those sushi kind of place. So it's a kind of delicacy, delicate delicacy in yeah. In Japanese too. And also like how to eat like a pickles ginger depends you like to change your taste. You are eating different fish. So you you have to change oh, your it cleanses like your taste. Palate. Yeah, cleansing kind of thing probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, that's I, I it. love pickled ginger. I eat it just straight but up. When you, yeah, that's great. But it's when, so you, good. when you go to the uh, really expensive restaurant, I've never been those kind of places, but <laughs> that's kind of because it's gonna be thousands of dollars to spend over like, over one meal. Um those kind of things. You don't you don't say like you know um uh which one do I want to eat? I'll trust you, like you know, so they're gonna make it for you, the chef in front of chef. Chef is going to serve it. And then they say like you know at first you are going to eat 
light taste fish to go to more oily one. So like the mouth is not going to just uh, get used to with the strong like an oily taste or like a tuna salmon tuna or those ones a little bit at the end to come so those kind of order to whatever their fish great like a fresh fish they get today from the uh, special market when they get it get it and then they're gonna decide which one to serve first type of things wow. but well, that's, I, that's really scary like how much we are spending that much money. So therefore, now Jim, Jim had a really nice slide, like a slide, but you, you are gone. But we now invented the uh, uh, conveyor belt. Con Can I take, no, conveyor belt. Conveyor belt. Conveyor like belt. Sushi. Mm -hmm. So those ones, they, are, they know, like one dish is like, for instance, like a Five hundred, like a five, like a five dollars one. So how many dishes I'm piling it up means how much we are paying. And also we see it, what kind of thing is coming. Mm. Sushi is coming mm. all over, like we're going around, around, around. This one was actually made it in the uh, China. I mean, like the Chinese people migrated in like a uh, Manchuria, and then they had a great success. And that person, after we lost the World War II, the mm -hmm. Manchuria went back to China and those people came back to Japan. And then they started at the exact the same kind of build a conveyor like a sushi and then got a success. And about they didn't have enough like a sushi chef. That's why sushi chef is making it in the middle and they are making it like for the whole dish. And, but then like, you know, start making it more like a successful that it's going to be 19 like 1970s and like 1960s 70s again this is the invention came to america too actually right i, I have a question for yeah i think it did about the same time it became popular um i i have a question for you um and i guess i should know this but i have heard from other japanese they've told me that uh, wasabi the, uh, the 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 green horseradish paste that's put on, on on the side and people put on sushi that the reason why it, it tastes like that and the reason why it's used is that it's kind of it, it, it could kill germs and it's like it, it's a way to make this the sushi more sanitized or the fish more sanitized is there any truth to that or is that just people lying to me again no that's how we were told when we oh, were, you were told that too vinegar and also the uh, like a such kind of wasabi too. It I mean like it's not really bad one, but it's not having fishy smell too. You can kill it too. So that's how we were. But uh, we shouldn't give it to little kids. That's why I, I was kind of think, you guys feeling funny when you put the picture for serving fish to kids. We don't serve ed edozushi fish sushi so much to kids. Number one, <laughs> it's expensive. <laughs> Number two, we don't want to put the uh, wasabi. So the kids sushi, nigiri sushi, we take all the wasabi out. Oh, by the way, in Japan, those nigiri sushi, wasabi is already in the between rice and oh. fish. It's okay. already comes came, comes with it. It's but if you don't, side, wanna, you don't want to do it for like kids, we take it off. Mm -hmm. And those kind of thing. And uh, so a little bit different from America in that sense. Well, Jim and Naboka, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Thank I just, you so much. I've learned a lot and I want to eat. I always want to eat after these programs, but I'm always mostly just amazed at how how culture evolves <laughs> and um, the way that it, it translates into different contexts. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, for those of you still listening, we will certainly release this video on our YouTube channel for all to access and enjoy. Usually that's done within 48 hours or so. Um, and our final, final installment of Breaking Bread is Saturday, November 13th at 1 p.m. Sunday sauce, an Italian staple. So uh, look forward to some um, information forthcoming about that. Any last words, friends? <laughs> well, um, I'll go first, I guess. I'll give Nobuko the last word. Uh, I want to thank everybody uh, for attending and putting up with us. Uh, I, I, the questions were fun. The discussions were fun. So I've learned a lot, as always, uh, from interacting with everybody. So I want to thank the library staff and everybody uh, for the invitation. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for everybody. I, I hope we and I 
answered your questions, but I couldn't hear your voice voices that I, I don't know I did it everything okay or not. If I didn't, I'm sorry, we will read your questions. You and, did great. And I, I caught the questions. Mostly you're just getting a lot of thank yous and thank yous and kudos. And it was really great. A great you. program. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Our pleasure.